White Wine Production White wines are usually processed first in the cellar, since they're usually harvested before most reds. This is because, on average, they get to appropriate ripeness earlier. We'll go over white wine processing first. After the fruit is picked, it's brought to the crush pad. The crush pad is a place for processing fruit near the cellar. Ideally, harvest takes place early in the morning or even at night to keep the fruit cool. Here's the crush pad where we initially process fruit. Right here are stacks of lugs, which are basically plastic baskets that we hand pick grapes into out in the vineyard. You can carry about 25 pounds in each one of these little baskets. Once these lugs are full, we dump them into bins. The reason we do this is so that a tractor can easily carry a large load of fruit in these bins from the vineyard down to the crush pad. As we harvest, we're also sorting. Mog, or material other than grapes, is removed from the harvest bins. This can be leaves or shoots or even tools that someone forgot in their harvest bin. It's also used to clear out damaged or subpar fruit. Sorting is done before pressing, sometimes out in the field by hand, and sometimes by using special equipment like a sorting table. A sorting table is like a big conveyor belt that allows us to spread out the fruit and pick out berries that do not meet standards. The important thing here is that the fruit must be clean and of the highest quality. Remember, fruit is the base of your wine. We spend a lot of time sorting because we want the absolute best product to make our wine. Next up, the grapes are squeezed and juice runneth over. Here's a picture of my daughter stomping her first grapes last year. Contrary to popular belief, not many people in the commercial winemaking industry are actually pressing grapes with their feet. When you're processing tons of fruit per day, it unfortunately would probably wear us out. Instead, we use presses. Bins are dumped or fruit is conveyed into a press. Here are some whole clusters being dumped into our membrane press. And this is just one type of press. Let's look at ours first. This is the inside of a membrane press. A membrane press, like the one in the last picture, is a large drum with a bladder membrane on one side and a drain screen on the other. Once it's full of fruit, the membrane fills up with air and presses grapes against the screen on the left. As it presses those grapes against the screen, the juice will come out of those holes. After it presses for a little while, it deflates, and then it rolls the drum to break up the fruit and repeats the process again. The membrane will gradually press harder and harder as it moves through these cycles to get the most juice out without pressing too hard and getting too many tannins or mog coming out of the drain screen. Here's a picture of juice coming out from the drain screen and falling into a big pan underneath. From here, it's pumped into a tank. A basket press is exactly what it sounds like. It's a large wooden basket with just enough space for the juice to leak out but not grapes. Fruit is dumped in and a large plate presses down on the top of the fruit. This plate crushes the fruit on itself and juice flows through the basket's openings and into a pan surrounding the press. And again, from there, the juice is pumped into a tank. Now, let's talk about pumice. What is it? Pumice is simply grapes that have been squeezed and are left over from the pressing process. Some call pumice the spent grapes. Pumice actually has many uses. You can give it back to the vineyard as compost, it can be used to make brandy, or you can actually feed it to livestock. Fun fact, if you feed it to dairy cows in the right proportion to their normal diet, it tends to increase the amount of butter fat in their milk, just in case you're a dairy farmer. Next up is settling. After the juice is pumped into a tank, it's cooled and settles out overnight clarifying by gravity. It's sometimes necessary to add fining agents to speed up or improve the process of removing suspended solids. And fining agents do just that. They speed up or improve the process of removing suspended solids. Next, it's time for the magic. Primary fermentation. The juice is inoculated with a yeast culture, or it's simply left in a clean storage container to begin fermentation, allowing the yeast that's naturally present in the juice to replicate and transform the juice into wine. Fermentation is when juice becomes wine. 
Now, if you remember our equation, you'll know sugar plus yeast equals alcohol plus carbon dioxide plus heat. Also, keep in mind here that white wine is produced from fermenting the juice alone, just the liquid juice. We'll compare that to red wine production in a moment. Fermentation is an exciting time, and it needs to be constantly monitored. Appropriate temperature and nutrient levels are incredibly important for the yeast, and I include oxygen in the word nutrients. On the left is a picture of fermentation that's a bit too vigorous because it was a little bit too warm. This tank needed to be cooled pretty quickly. White wines are generally fermented slightly cooler than red wines. This is partially because heat will allow volatile aroma compounds to escape the wine quickly. Now white wines have less of these compounds and more subtle aroma compounds, and we want to keep those fragile things in the wine so that you can enjoy them later in your glass. So this is the same principle that explains why it's harder to smell a really, really cold wine. If you warm up a cold wine with your hands, you'll notice it gains a stronger aroma. And we're doing the opposite here. We keep the wine cool now so that the aromas don't escape and then you can enjoy them in your glass later. So here's an experiment. Next time you open a bottle, put a glass of it in the fridge. After 10 minutes, pull out that glass and then compare it to the wine at room temperature. And you'll notice a pretty amazing difference between the aromas of the two. After primary fermentation, sometimes a winemaker will want to make a style choice of putting his or her wines through secondary fermentation. And this is also known as malolactic fermentation. Now it's not as complicated as it sounds. This is when malolactic bacteria converts the malic acid in wine into lactic acid. So just like yeast will convert sugar into ethanol, malolactic bacteria converts malic acid in wine into lactic acid. So the secondary fermentation is done by bacteria instead of yeast, and it's simply transforming the acid. The bacteria consumes malic acid and produces lactic acid. Well, you may ask why that would actually make a difference. Well, malic acid is an acid prevalent in apples, while lactic acid is an acid prevalent in milk. So think of that change when you're considering wine, going from a sharp, fruity flavor of malic acid to a creamy, smooth flavor of lactic acid. This is a great option for getting a particular style for a winemaker. For example, this is usually done with those big, oaked, buttery, creamy Chardonnays. This is not done for something like a sharp, crisp, citrusy Riesling. Now, almost all red wines go through this process, but most white wines avoid it. Most white wines retain a sharp, citrusy, bright acidity, and you get that with malic acid. Next, we will be racking. Racking is when we move wine from our fermentation vessel to another vessel, leaving the lees and sediment behind. So think of racking as using a straw to drink from your glass, but you leave the undesirable stuff at the bottom. And let's back up for one second. Let me define lees. Lees is dead yeast cells. After fermentation, you'll usually have some suspended yeast cells, or lees, left in the wine, which is good because that actually protects it from oxygen. Some winemakers actually choose to keep a lot of lees in their wine because it can impart interesting, full-bodied flavors and mouthfeel. Racking is technically done multiple times as wine ages. It's a useful tool for clarifying. Now it's time to mature our wines. Wines need time to mature in their proper vessels. On average, white wines are ready sooner than red wines. Maturing is another point of style among winemakers, too. Depending on what you want, you may age white wines in stainless steel, barrels, concrete, or even clay amphora. Different vessels will contribute different qualities to wine. So the two main vessels that we hear about a lot would be stainless steel and barrels. Stainless steel is truly the neutral vessel. It imparts no flavors and there's no oxygen exchange from the outside environment 
into the wine. Oak barrels, on the other hand, are a little bit different. Barrels impart tannins into the wine. They actually seep out of the wood and float around in the wine. Oak barrels also allow for a very, very small amount of oxygenation. So the oxygen will pass through the barrel into the wine. And this is sometimes really important for aging properly. So again, it really depends on what you want when you're maturing your wine. Finally, your wine is almost ready and it's time for finishing touches. Fining agents may be added again to get the perfect clarity for that wine. And again, fining agents are simply added to speed up or improve the process of removing suspended solids. Now it's time to blend. When we make certain wines in the cellar, we can have different batches of the same thing. Here's an example. Sometimes I use different yeasts on the same varietal, like Viognier. Sometimes one wine will be stored in multiple different kinds of vessels like our Cab Franc is stored in Hungarian oak and French oak. It's important to take time to get to know the benefits of these components and blend them in the appropriate proportions to make the best wine. And we're almost there. It's time to stabilize. There are some final steps for wine to be stabilized before going into bottle. Sulfites will probably be added for protection against oxygen. Also, a wine can be heat st stabilized to keep a haze from forming if the wine ever gets hot. A wine can also be cold stabilized to prevent sediment from forming in the bottle. And finally, it may need minimal acid adjustments. And we made it to bottling. Bottles are finally filled, corked, labeled, and capsuled. Now it's time to put it in a case and leave it alone for a while. Let it age and let those flavors mingle and mature and start to get ready to be consumed by your customer. Since that was a fury of information, here is a summary. Remember, white winemaking is fermentation of the juice alone. We'll have a comparison of the different types of production at the end. White wine versus red wine versus rosé wine production.